Thank you. The next item of business is topical questions. And we'll start with question number one from Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to EIS members considering supporting industrial action. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government would encourage negotiations in all circumstances on all employment issues to avoid industrial action. Tavish Scott. Thank you. The Teaching Union EIS has today published figures on the pressure teachers face. 54% of teachers say their workload has risen in the last year. A further third say their workload has increased significantly. Despite all the parliamentary assurances saying teacher workload is falling, it is actually rising. Does that not starkly illustrate that this government is out of touch with the reality of teaching across Scotland? And will the Education Secretary not accept that teachers are considering strike action as his improvement plan and tackling bureaucracy initiatives have failed to address that very pressure in the classroom? Cabinet Secretary. The Government has taken a series of steps to tackle the issue of teacher workload. Uh, they have included the removal of unit assessments, the work for which will apply in the next academic year. The publication of benchmarks to provide clarity at the levels that uh, students are expected to achieve within Curriculum for Excellence and to pro provide the clarity that the teaching profession requested. Uh, we have issued curricular guidance to provide the clarity that uh, issues of literacy, numeracy and health and well-being, uh, these curricular areas should be given priority within the curriculum. And I have given uh, guidance issued to all teachers which indicates that uh, the teaching profession should uh, be free to concentrate on learning and teaching and enhancing learning and teaching for young people across the education system. In addition to that, I have commissioned Her Majesty's Inspector of Education to audit the burden of bureaucracy which is applied to schools by local authorities. And as Mr Scott will realise, um, about half of the local authorities were identified in that inspection to have work to do to reduce the workload that was being applied to schools and that reduction in workload is now, un a re reduction in bureaucracy is now being undertaken. So I would um, encourage Mr Scott to look at the various measures the government has taken uh, to reduce the workload on teachers, to ensure that our teachers can be free to concentrate on what we need them to concentrate on, which is learning and teaching. Tavish Scott. The point, surely, presiding officer, is we have looked at the initiatives that government have brought forward and the figures today from the EIS illustrate that far from going down, the workload is increasing. In 2014, an EIS survey said that 44% of teachers would not recommend teaching as a profession. The latest survey again today suggests that figure has risen to 56%. In two days' time, the Education Secretary will propose school reform. Will he accept that Thursday's statement must now include a far-reaching independent assessment of teachers' paying conditions on Macron too, and that the 16% cut in teachers' wages over the past decade is repaired, the promotion structure in schools is reviewed, and that the standing of the profession, the most important profession for Scotland's future, is enhanced, not allowed to wither any further. Cabinet Secretary. I certainly agree with Mr Scott that we need to enhance the teaching profession and the statement that I will make to Parliament on Thursday will be designed to take a number of very substantive steps to ensure the enhancement of the professional responsibility of teachers and to enable teachers to fulfil the role that we all require them to fulfil in delivering education for young people in Scotland. Uh, secondly, I acknowledge that there has been constraint in public sector pay for some considerable time and I cannot deny that. I was the author of the public sector pay policy in Scotland as the finance minister and I make no attempt to deny it. What I think Mr Scott needs to reflect on is that he was a supporter of a United Kingdom government mm. that presided over austerity for five years which created the financial climate in which this government had to operate. So if we are all, as I'm accepting my responsibility as the author of public sector pay policy in Scotland for many years, I think Mr Scott has to accept that the challenges that have existed around teachers', teachers pay and public sector pay in general uh, have not been the product of a ind individual decisions taken by this government, but of the financial climate that he and his colleagues in the Liberal Democrats were prepared to support within the United Kingdom government without complaint for a five-year period. And finally, yeah. uh, I would say to Mr Scott that the government is determined to ensure that we work with the profession, we work with other stakeholders, we work with our local authority partners 
to ensure that we strengthen Scottish education. That will be at the heart of the reforms that I take forward. It's been at the heart of the measures I have taken to reduce bureaucracy and to focus the curriculum, and I will continue to do so in the period ahead. Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in light of the first part of the answer that Mr Swinney has just given to Tavish Scott, does he foresee an opportunity within the governance reforms and greater autonomy for schools to allow greater devolution of pay structures and the working conditions to head teachers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, one of the points that I made when I introduced the governance consultation paper to Parliament some months ago was that I envisaged the continuation of national uh, terms and conditions discussions in, in Scotland. Uh, that uh, will be my position in the governance review on Thursday. Um, it was my position at the outset and, of course, um, for the other details of the governance review, um, I will be making a statement to Parliament on Thursday and I will, of course, answer the questions that members have to me on the details that I put to Parliament at that time. Ian Gray. We read today uh, in the press that uh, a welcome additional £2 million has been made available to colleges to finally honour their pay deal with lecturers. How much additional funding, then, will the Cabinet Secretary make available to local authorities to allow them to address teachers' concerns about salary and workload and thus avoid industrial action in our schools? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, clearly, there is a process of negotiation to be undertaken with the teaching trade unions as part of the SNCT arrangements with which Mr Gray will be familiar. Uh, the Government will, of course, as a member of the SNCT, participate in those discussions and we look forward to progressing those discussions in the period that lies ahead. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I remind members from the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, does the Deputy First Minister agree that there is a varying national picture with regard to teacher workload, which is often driven by local authorities, for example, in terms of tracking and monitoring, reporting and recording of attainment uh, data, for example? And can he therefore outline what action the Government has taken to ensure greater consistency across Scotland when it comes to what our local authorities are asking of Scotland's teachers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, part of what I've asked uh, local authorities to do uh, as part of the work which we all committed to uh, long before I became the Education Secretary was to reduce the workload that, and the bureaucracy that is applied to the teaching profession. So I look to local authorities to exercise uh, a considered judgment about the appropriate collection of information um, of a tracking and monitoring nature to ensure that that uh, is appropriate and commensurate with their responsibilities. Um, as I indicated in my earlier answer to Tavish Scott, I asked Education Scotland to undertake a focused review of the demands placed on schools by local authorities in relation to curriculum for excellence. They found that uh, there were a number of uh, local authorities where there was a significant variation in the extent and the effectiveness of the actions that have been taken. And I am, of course, continuing to monitor the progress that's been made to support improvement, to address the specific issues and to share best practice between authorities. And Ross Greer. Thank you. The latest inflation figures released this morning show a four-year high of 2.9% and expectation that it will continue to rise due to fallout from Brexit. The public sector pay cap has seen a massive erosion in the value of salaries. Teachers are now considering strike action and rising inflation is only going to make the situation worse for them. How much loss to the value of teachers' pay is the Scottish Government willing to accept before it will act on the pay freeze? Cabinet Secretary. As I indicated in my earlier answer, um, I seek, I, I in no way try to avoid my responsibility for public sector pay. I was the finance minister here for nine years and I made a, a, a very clear judgment, which I was open about with Parliament, that in order to protect public sector employment, I had to ask public sector employees in a period of significant fiscal restraint applied to us by the United Kingdom government, of which Tavish Scott was a supporter and the Conservatives were supporters, that I had to apply that con pay constraint to protect employment. Uh, I, I, accept, I accept that the situation we now face, where there is rising inflation in the context of pay restraint, it is difficult to support that given the pressures that are on individual um, public sector workers. So the government will look carefully at the issues of public sector pay as part of our negotiations with trade unions and as part of the budget preparations that the government un undertakes on an annual basis. Question number two, Jamie Green. To ask the Scottish Government what the final cost will be of the Edinburgh-Glasgow Improvement Programme. 
Minister Hamza Youssef. As I recently informed, the Chamber Network Rail has confirmed a further delay to the route electrification. We now await further advice from Network Rail on the costs arising from that delay. Mark Khan, the Chief Executive of Network Rail, will be in front of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee tomorrow, of which, of course, I know the member uh, is a member of. Jamie Green. Uh, the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme was supposed to cost the taxpayer £742 million. However, just under a year ago, it was reported that this had already risen by £32 million. Uh, there was a further delay announced uh, to replace faulty electrical equipment and the additional staffing costs that that might incur. So can the Minister outline today if he expects any further increases to the cost of the improvement programme? And can he tell Parliament, more importantly, if these additional costs will impact any other uh, rail projects or rail funding in general? Minister. I thank the member uh, for the question and the tone in which he asks it. Uh, you know, he will be very aware that the responsibility for the delivery of the project is Network Rail. So the Transport Scotland, the Scottish Government, is the client, is the funder. Uh, we have, of course, uh, an, an, a, a, a ceiling, uh, funding ceiling that we must work uh, within. Uh, and I don't expect that uh, funding ceiling to, to be breached, if that is his question. However, there is, and there has been a further delay. We're continuing to have discussions with Network Rail. Uh, I would have to really defer to Network Rail to come back to us with what the potential cost increases would be of that the last report of the cost increases we did from a Scottish Government perspective was an independent uh, report by Ernst & Young, which again the committee uh, had sight of. Uh, this is actually a shared problem with the UK Government uh, as well. We know Network Rail is a reclassified body under the Department for Transport. Uh, clearly, uh, the UK Government is also facing similar issues with Network Rail. We and the Scottish Government are facing uh, similar issues uh, now that the Government, uh, and certainly Cabinet members, have been appointed. Um, I would be keen to sit down with the Railway Minister and the UK Government as soon as possible to see how we can come to some sort of shared solution because it is not uh, an acceptable position that we fund these major projects, we are the client of these major projects, and yet the delivery done by Network Rail are not, is not accountable to this Government uh, or indeed this Parliament. Mm -hmm. Jamie Green. I thank the Minister for that answer. I, I, I notice the Minister is somewhat passing the buck to Network Rail, but surely as the Minister in charge of transport in Scotland, he would have some oversight and indeed be able to share with the Parliament the costs of this project. Um, we now know that electric trains won't actually be delivered on the Edinburgh Glas Glasgow line until October this year. That's nearly a year after the original 2016 deadline, uh, with a, a whole range of problems, uh, including the breakdown of components, poor project management, unforeseen corrective action, and a delay in the energisation of the over overhead cables. A spokesman for the Scottish Government themselves has said that this is wholly unacceptable. So what assurances can the Minister provide to passengers in Scotland who have already su uh, suffered quite significant disruptions on this line uh, that they will now have to potentially wait until autumn for electric trains to be in operation? Does he not agree this is unacceptable? Minister. Of course I agree that's un unacceptable, but uh, let me just take issue with one or two things that uh, Jamie Green uh, has said. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't expect me as the Minister for Transport to be literally on the wires, on the lines, delivering this project that is delivered by Network Rail. So yes, we have responsibility as the funder, but we are the client. But the delivery of the project is done by Network Rail, a reclassified body under the UK government's Department for Transport. Uh, and in terms of our projects, yes, of course, it's unacceptable when there is any delay. The last time I informed this chamber, in fact, in front of the committee, uh, no doubt under his questioning, was that electric services we were expecting to come on this route in July of this year. It's now gone into October. That is extremely disappointing. But again, just to give a comparison, uh, the delays of some projects south of the border have been not months, but years, four years, uh, for example, on the Trans-Pennine electrification for talking's sake. So we are in a better position, but I agree that it is wholly unacceptable that Network Rail are continuing to come to me to say that we are unable to deliver this project, despite the fact, of course, that we have, as the funder and as the client, provided the funding that is there. In terms of the reassurance to the passenger, yes, we have a project board which is actually helping to flush out some of these issues much earlier then we would have had sight of them before. And my commitment to this parliament is to continue to keep you updated as a parliament and indeed the, uh, the, the relevant committee uh, whenever I get that information from Network Rail. But I would, uh, and I would end on this point uh, to the member, I would welcome a discussion 
uh, with parties across this chamber, uh, even if they don't agree with the full devolution of network rail, which I respect as the position that they may hold, to at least think about the devolution of the infrastructure projects, because it is unacceptable, once again, I may say, that we fund these projects, yet the accountability remains uh, with network rail, a reclassified body under the Department for Transport. John Mason. Hey, thank you. I wonder if the Minister can confirm that the original cost of Egypt was quite a lot higher and that the idea of running longer trains eh, with less frequency meant there was huge savings on signalling, less congestion and I imagine better for the environment. Minister. Yes, there have been cost savings not only on, on these projects but actually some other projects uh, as, as, as well. But that's not to take away, and I must uh, reiterate that, that does not take away from the fact uh, that we have seen a cost increase from our revised estimates coming because Network Rail, uh, I think, uh, have failed to notice very, uh, you know, have failed to uh, notice some uh, foreseen circumstances. They should have been able to foresee some of those circumstances. That's not to take away from that. Uh, we wait uh, from Network Rail to get a further update in regards to what further delay there may be on Egypt. And there is a potential that that may have a cost increase. So that is not to let Network Rail off the hook on that. Having said that, I am confident uh, that our railway projects, the many railway projects that we are looking to deliver in control period five can be delivered uh, within that funding ceiling uh, that we have committed to. So there have been savings, and there have been savings not just on Egypt but on other projects, but let's not take away from the fact that this is disappointing news and network rail should be held to account not just to the Department for Transport but to this parliament and to this government. Neil Bibby. Um, as left the train, drivers' unions say that Egypt has been mismanaged and lacked political leadership by both Network Rail and the Scottish Government. As the Scottish Government is ultimately responsible for this project, and it is ultimately responsible for this project, despite what the Minister may be trying to suggest otherwise, does the Transport Minister accept that there has been a failure of political leadership on Egypt from the start? And what will he do now to reassure the workforce, the passengers and the taxpayer that his Government should be trusted any longer with meeting the railway infrastructure needs of this country? Minister. I think it's a beyond ludicrous question uh, from the member for a number of reasons because Egypt, of course, has already delivered uh, on many occasions. December 2010, electrification of Haymarket Tunnel. We'll take the political leadership, I'm sure, for that. December 2013, the transformed Haymarket station opened to passengers on time and on budget as part of Egypt. May 2014, the electrification of Glasgow to Cumbernault. He forgot to mention that. May 2015, Haymarket and Verkeithing re-signalling complete. He forgot to mention that. December 2016, Edinburgh Gateway Rail Tram Interchange opened to all passengers. Of course, he forgot to mention all of that. So Egypt has, of course, met many of the milestones. We have funded uh, them, uh, of course, and he should recognise that. On top of Egypt, if he wants political leadership on the railways, we, of course, delivered borders, railway, Airgate, uh, Airdrie to Bathgate, electrification, as I said, of the Cumbernauld Line, one that affects him, of course, the Paisley Corridor improvements, and many, many other rail projects as well. So I'll certainly take no lessons from Neil Bibby when it comes uh, to management of our railways. I would suggest that he looks at his own Labour colleague, the former Transport Minister in the UK, Tom Harris, who said, uh, who said the Scottish Government is responsible for the strategic direction and funding of the Scottish Rail Network but this responsibility cannot be properly exercised while network rail remains answerable to the UK government. Reform Scotland, the think tank he was working with, believes that network rail in Scotland should be fully accountable to the Scottish government. And that means it must be devolved. That is somebody who used to be a transport minister within a Labour government in the UK government. I would suggest you, Bibby, instead of carping from the sideline, actually take some expert advice on how to manage our railways. And Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Minister, people will be incredibly frustrated with this delay, uh, not least because the drip drip of information prevents anyone taking full responsibility. So can the Minister tell Parliament on what date he was informed of the potential delays to the project and is he willing to publish all minutes of meetings in which the delay was discussed? Minister. Uh, in terms of uh, the documentation about the delay, I have a letter from uh, Mark Carn sent to me on the 25th uh, of May, I have written to the committee convener. Uh, if a copy of that letter, uh, if it is able to be published, of course, I will look into that and I will discuss that uh, with my officials. But I also share 
his frustration and indeed the public's frustration at the drip, drip, drip of information that we tend to get from Network Rail. As I continue to say, Network Rail is accountable to the UK government, ultimately under the Department for Transport as a reclassified body. I would like a conversation with him and with members across the chamber on how we actually rebalance some of this and ensure that Network Rail is accountable to this parliament uh, and to this government. But in terms of his actual question, of course, I will look into uh, the latest letter that I received from Mark Carn uh, and uh, see if that can be uh, released. Thank you very much. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Angela Constance on the Independent Advisory Group on Hate Crime, Prejudice and Community Cohesion. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so if you do wish to ask a question, please press your request to speak button now. They'll be allowed around 20 minutes for questions after the statement.